Welcome to Trade Happy. Welcome back to another Traders Podcast episode. In this episode, we've got someone who's influenced my personal trading quite a lot. Um, I hope you guys find value from this. Um, I know I have. Um, it's really, really good. He goes into quite a lot of detail into his own trading, talks about time, round numbers, um, you know, the Asian session, London session, New York session. And what you should be expecting in all of those if you do enjoy it drop a like drop a comment below if you learned anything new and hit the subscribe button because we're coming out with these every single week and we're also doing daily uh, live streams from nine till five if you have any questions during the podcast comment them below and i'll get back to them or if i can't answer them myself i'll reach out to stacy and see if he can um reply to them there's a little hint there. I kind of just dropped that by accident. Um, please welcome Stacey Burke. For anyone that doesn't know who you are, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Certainly. Uh, my name is Stacey Burke. I'm originally from Canada, down in the Great Lakes area near the uh, American border. And uh, grew up playing ice hockey and gridiron, competitive sport, triathlon, everything always been competitive by nature, I suppose and uh, studied chiropractic, uh, did a bachelor's degree in political science. I was going to go to law school and um, decided uh, through my interest in sport and everything else to pursue a career in chiropractic. I had a friend who was studying it and I took a look at it and I thought it was a a great profession. And I moved down to St. Louis, studied there for uh, four and a half years. And a few years later, after uh, being in North Carolina, had the opportunity to come down to Australia for a couple of years, live near the beach. That was in 1998. A buddy of mine that I was at university with was down here and uh, I just thought I'd come down and surf and, you know, have some sunshine and beaches for a few years. Sounds and that's nice. where I got exposed to uh, the markets. Uh, I mean, I would, I'd always been interested in the market, but I didn't know anything about it. And then I attended a, a workshop here in 98 on uh, trading the index futures. And that uh, from that moment, I was, I suppose, hooked. And uh, the education that I received at that time was excellent. It was um, first class, very basic, uh, old school charting, uh, just simple charts, trend lines, um, you know, patterns, breakouts, uh, just different simple stuff. But it was a, a basic model. But I, of course, thought, well, if we can make some money trading this way, end of day, Surely we must be able to make a lot more money if we get if we start trading interday. Mm. And um, of course, we had a few trades that uh, worked out well, but we didn't really have a, a system or any rules that we followed. And of course, that didn't end too well. <laughs> and that uh, began my journey of, I suppose, uh, trying to figure out how to master the markets. And uh, the brother of this friend of mine, who was also down here, there are Canadians. And um, he was telling me about Forex. This was around 2002, somewhere in there. And, and I'd never heard of Forex other than I knew that current, there was currency futures that we had traded as well, but not, but again, that was end of day. But uh, from that beginning where Forex just was starting to become a retail product, um, you know, I w- attended another workshop with a guy here in Perth who uh, was a young guy who was trading fairly successful at the time. And uh, I learned a lot from him, but could never really seem to get consistent. Again, I didn't really have a structured model to follow. I didn't understand all of that stuff. I just thought we're going to trade this thing and make money. And um, that couldn't have been further from the truth. I don't think, you know, we had a few winners, but mostly losses and just, again, couldn't figure out, I suppose, what it was, why we, we were looking for the holy grail of entries and exits and, um, you know, completely oblivious to any other grand design that the market might have been following. And it, it's been a painful, it was a painful journey <laughs> forward to where we're at now. I practiced for 20 years and uh, about three or four years ago, I sold my portion of the practice. And at that point, I felt I was consistent enough to move off into trading full-time and from that point uh 
there's been challenges certainly, and nothing's ever a smooth road in the market. Uh, I think as time goes on, though, you start to, well, hopefully you identify, I guess, what your strengths are and uh, what you need to do to manage yourself to hopefully stay in the game and um, what you need to do to not only stay in the game, but but grow your trading business and, um, you know, I suppose keep getting better. Mm. And what were your initial thoughts um, about trading? Did you have any initial uh, thoughts coming into it? Into trading uh, just generally? Yeah. Well, I, I, I really, uh, as I said, uh, the education that I received at the time was, was fantastic. I have a huge amount of respect for the two gentlemen that I learned from. Uh, I just couldn't understand why nobody had ever shown me anything about this before. Uh, you know, why didn't we learn anything like this in school or how markets worked uh, in terms of trading them? And uh, I guess I, I suppose you're a bit naive to some degree. You think you, you look at some charts with technical analysis on them or basic, you know, just basic bar charts and some trend lines. And you think, well, I don't get it. Why, why didn't anybody show me this? It's pretty straightforward. But then I suppose you learn that as we all learn, uh, the market's constantly evolving and dynamic and um, you need to, there's a whole hidden agenda about the market really that we tend, never tend to look at and that's ourselves. <laughs> uh, the market's always going to be the same in the, in the sense that it's, it's going to be a variable, but you yourself as a person uh, are really the, the one thing that you need to be, I suppose um, you need to master yourself because if you you are the uh, most important factor uh, and m most of the trading stuff that's out there, you know, courses, all that stuff, never, never address, you know, that we, we give word service to trading psychology and all that. But at the end of the day, it's it's the trader, you know, you can have a, you can have 10 traders trading the same system and they'll all have 10 different results not even similar at all in in nature and and that's because the traders themselves are all wired so differently and have a whole host of issues that will you know 90 some percent of retail traders end up blowing up or, or losing and um, again the question is is it, is it the trading is it the markets or is it the trader so i guess uh two journeys one trying to figure out the market and then realizing that even when you figure the market out that I had a whole lot of problems that I needed to sort out if I wanted to achieve certain goals doing this. And um, mm. that was a process itself as well. Yeah. Can you briefly describe your strategy that you currently use now? Certainly. Um, I primarily, fo primarily focused uh, in that first couple hours specifically of the trading day for me is uh, yeah, the, I focus everything around New York time. So I suppose eight to, to 11 PM is my Asian session. So that first hour is before the equity markets open. I know people message me and tell me Tokyo opens at certain times and all that. But to me, it's the first hour is the pre-market or the setting it up of the market. The second hour is is when the market will typically put in a peak formation or make its move. And then the third hour uh, is taking the profits. Now, obviously, it's not like that every single session. Sometimes the move will happen in the first hour, especially if it's been building up in, in terms of uh, creeping trends and coiling. Uh, and sometimes it may be a creeping trend in that three hour window and move just at the end of that three hour window. So, but it's, if you put, you know, these colored zones on your charts, most of the time, nine times out of 10, the high and low will be in the middle of one of those three hour sessions. And so I focus my main emphasis is on buying low and selling high. And, uh, you know, of course, over the course of the week itself, Monday through Friday, we end up having trades that will sometimes come off the high of the week or the low of the week, moving to the other side. So I'm basically 
always sort of targeting uh, asymmetrical risk reward. I want to be buying, you know, if we picture, I always talk about picturing the price action like a box. And I want to be buying at the bottom of the box and keeping my risk nice and tight and selling up at the top of the box. You know, so I might buy low for a move up towards the high or to the middle of the box and vice versa for selling. And again, coming back to round numbers, just through observation, really, I just started to observe that, you know, the price action was moving off of numbers. And um, of course, you recognize that it major round numbers seem to have a bit more significance. And then as time went on, I could see that there was 50 pip shifts almost every session. Uh, you no, know, not always, not always perfectly tradable, but there was movement where they would maybe extend out a quarter or, or into a quarter below and then trade in that range and then shift and then move at 50 pips the other way, which again, coming back to uh, just sort of the psychology behind that, they would drag traders up high or down low and, and keep that trend creeping. Obviously, uh, indicators, everything else will get traders following that trend before shifting and then moving at another 50 pips outside of that range. So obviously now traders are either stopped out or if they're holding on to that, their losses are growing to the point where, you know, most retail traders typically will have a 20, 25 pip stop somewhere in that range. Um, so if you think just in terms of numbers, if they're shifting it or trapping volume inside of those 25 pip boxes uh, and then bang, all of a sudden they hit, hit the higher the low trigger stops or shift it and go back the other way. But if they move at 50 pips, now you're, you're looking at some traders, if they've sold down low, they might be down 60, 70 pips. Uh, so the timings for me are really important. Uh, the round numbers and then the high and the low, I just, uh, again, through observation, through learning, and then sort of learning different pieces from people about how I think that the market, you know, would move towards, taking money from the many and shifting it to the few <laughs> mm. uh, and why so many retail traders lose, you know, this whole thing about fundamental analysis and commitments of traders and volume and all that. I just, I have no real belief in any of that. Um, I just don't think that any of that is accurate for the type of trading that I do. I know that, you know, obviously there'll be people that disagree with that, but I really do believe it's a game of, trapping as many traders in the wrong direction as possible and then stopping them out, which means that those stop losses, that money goes from one account to the other account, meaning that, you know, somebody's made profits and other people have made losses. So mm, it's an yeah. awesome them game. It is. Yeah. And how long did it take you um, to develop that strategy and then become profitable with that? 20 years. 20, 20 years, 15 years of just banging my head on the wall, doing every single thing that I'd learned and read in books and courses and indicators and trying different, you know, uh, mechanical models and just doing every single thing. And then, and then a couple of years where I fine tuned it. And then another couple of years where I realized that I was still, I suppose, doing stupid things. So the trading side of it wasn't, wasn't the issue. Me working harder or studying more wasn't going to change any of the stupid things that I was doing. So like trying to get back to high water or averaging into a losing trade or taking trades that weren't even part of my trading plan, you, you, you get good, some good results. And then all of a sudden you're cocky and you're, you're over trading or you're taking more size on and it's not even a good trade setup. And next thing you know, you're, you know, just undone three months of, great trading. So yeah. then there's a few years where you're just getting that consistency and you're respecting everything about the entire process. And I think you start to get comfortable. Like I'm a slow learner. So I think some people could probably, you know, obviously pick it up and do things right, right off the get go. Uh, but again, we're all driven by different things. And I think, um, sometimes you don't realize what the, what the problems are until you actually get right into them. And then it's a matter of actually, I suppose, accepting that the 
I needed to do that, do, work on those things. And then you have to develop strategies to hopefully um, not have those triggers present or, or put yourself in those situations that you know are not going to end well long term. You might get lucky here and there, but if you engage in bad behavior, the market at some point is going to win. Yeah, so how can a trader know if they have an actual edge? That's a great question. Um, I think that uh, like for my, my, the way that I'm trading, it's, you know, the edge is uh, in the sense that the behavior of the market's behavior is consistent every single session. When the session begins, they move it, they might move it up to double zeros and then move it down to 50 in that first 45 minutes uh, or, you know, 75 to 25 or, you know, whatever, but there'll be some kind of 25 to 50 pip box that they build. And my perception of edge is this, they, the high and the low is where the edge is at because that is the most important place where the market will either reverse that's where you can control your risk the best um, and it's also an area where you have opportunity for asymmetrical risk reward so you're risking you know one r for two r or three r or whatever uh, and i think traders how do they know when they would have edge uh that's a good question. I, I think like, you know, you have to develop an absolute certainty, not only about your process, but in its ability to perform. And I guess that's partly why I'm so pedantic about the clock and everything else, because I know that right on the minute, they will start moving the market at certain times. Um, you know, some people like the idea of having, statistics or an algorithmic type model uh, i think they're unaware of some of the other challenges with with that style of trading and so they have an edge on paper but then in live time the system goes through a choppy market it underperforms or, and they go into a drawdown and they pull the plug on the system and then they miss out on when the market goes into a trending phase or whatever type of model it is where they would have made a killing so again the the edge, I think, is probably more so in the trader himself or herself and their ability to be consistent. Um, I think you need something that you can duplicate that's simple, no matter what style of trading it is. If there's a lot of decision making or analysis, I think that's where the edge starts to become very minimal because now you're going to have analysis paralysis. You know, you're perception of the information will never be consistent. So edge is, uh, um, I think uh, I'm probably not even qualified to answer that. I, I just know that you need to know that what you're doing is working with absolute certainty. And then there's no interference to you being able to execute that consistently. Mm. And do you think that having backtesting results is good enough? Not really, no. Uh, I talk about this a lot in the videos. Uh, mm. People want to know about backtesting. I think what, what I, I have a firm belief in backtesting how you're going to perform. So everything that I do, everything that I tested, sort of shaped and modeled was based on how I knew I would react when I was at the screen again, which came from a lot of painful learning experiences. So when I'm testing something, I would say, okay, well, there, there's obviously where the, the opportunity was to buy or to sell. This is why I would have got out and all these things. But the real way that I needed to model that was how would I perceive this in live time? And, and again, that's why the clock is so important to me because almost, again, with, a, with no pun intended, like clockwork, the market will usually form these highs and lows very specifically on the hourly rotation at the last candle or the first candle, uh, you know, the first 
and second hour typically will form the high and the low for the session. Uh, and then they'll maybe work back into one of those extremes one more time before moving the market. Just little things that I needed to be able to focus on in that three hour window so specifically. And again, not every day, you know, it, it, it's taken me a long time to piece all that together, but you have to know yourself. Uh, so the back testing of, of data, you know, on the weekend and when everything's quiet and you're having your coffee and you're going through your charts and thinking, okay, this is my, my system. But when the market's trading, what you don't see on the, the dry chart is when they pulse the price or when the spreads are flashing or widening or when they, they move the market and then it sits there. You, you get in on a candle and on the testing data, it looks like you got in and it went, you know, three, four bars in a row and you made 50 pips or whatever. But on in the live market, they might have held it there for 14 minutes before they moved it in the last minute. And so that mm. makes a lot of traders get out of the trade or, um, you know, if they're in the wrong trade, they might uh, stay in the trade and then to find and then in that last minute they get they get stopped out. Just little things that you don't see on the live chart that end up that are designed to shake us out of winning trades, scare us out of winning trades, um, or get us to chase trades in the wrong direction. Um, you know, we chase the, the fast pulsing market in that first hour. We, we can't handle it anymore. We decide to get in and then the next candle completely goes against us and the market moves down 50 pips and we just bought yeah. the high of the day. You know, we've all done that. Um, but, but there's an, there's an intelligent design behind all that activity, which is designed to entice us into, into these moves or scare us out of the moves. So coming back to what you asked, um, the back testing, I think if you're trading interday, if it's end of day, it's no big deal. Cause it's, you know, they're, it's all dead. Right. But interday, or actually that's not even true. Cause the other thing about even an interday is that when you study the intraday, you realize that as soon as they trigger breakout orders on the highs and lows of the previous day, the market usually will be at least pull back at least 50 pips before it resumes its move back with into that extreme. And again, that's designed at putting at least 50 pips of heat into traders who get in early on a breakout, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, I suppose if you're checking it during the day, even though you're an end of day trader, some traders might pull the pin on a, a trade that still could potentially be a big winner. Um, just cause it's, they might have an 80 pip stop, but, but they might have 50 pips of heat and decide to cut it early only to watch it, check it a few hours later and they'd be up 25 pips, just stuff like that. So the trader isn't consistent with following their system in live time, but in their back testing, they are. So, yes. uh, that's the biggest thing I suppose is that the, the live trading is different from the back testing results. So, yeah. And obviously you show people how to trade on your YouTube channel. Um, what's a question that you constantly get asked about your strategy? Oh, okay. I think uh, one of the most common questions is, uh, uh, how do you tell you if you're at the high or the low, which I always find kind of funny because <laughs> my answer is always, you're either at the high or the low. And yeah. if you're not at the high or the low, you're inside the high and the low. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of qu similar questions. So again, uh, timings, people that are asking, always asking about timings, which is why I always tell them to Google it's New York time. There is no other time for me. It's just New York time. Actually, now that I've just had a second to think about it would be where do you actually get in? And mm. My answer is is very clear in that you want an engulfment or a pin hammer. So essentially working from the higher from the low, assuming that it's not a trend day. So if we're working, it, it could be a trend day, but we're still working from the high and the low. They could break out, pull back, we're buying low, selling high in a trend. Um, but that engulfment or pin hammer in within that, especially within the equities hour, that middle hour, designates that they are locking in that extreme and and when they're when they lock that in or they're reversing the market 
sometimes it'll be a, a 25 pip candle. Sometimes it'll be very subtle. It'll be a small two bar formation or, or there'll be uh, like today on the pound Aussie, there was a beautiful little W at the bottom of the market. They engulfed it. It was right at uh, 50. Uh, and that's an emphasis that they're done doing business down at that level. So the thesis behind that is that you can, place yourself into the market with your stop in place with the confidence nothing's ever absolute for or for certain but you can place your stop and your position in the market with confidence that they are done doing business down there because if they are going to move the market now that means they've they're going to go back and get the other trader who's in profit from Asia, for example, like as today on the pound Aussie, somebody shorted it. They were up 50 pips. They worked three pushes into the low. They engulfed it at the round numbers just before the Europe open. If they go back down into that area where they've got three hours of volume trapped, who are now all underwater, they're all in losses or been stopped out. They're going to allow that money that they've now, now got in their accounts, they're going to allow that money to go back to those traders who are in negative equity and, and, and allow that trader who's in profit in Asia to stay in profit. And again, mm -hmm. the name of the game is to make sure nobody makes any money for them and them being, you know, the bigger traders, the big, smart money institutions, banks, algos, whatever. Um, so that engulfment and pin hammer is a designation visually on the chart of the price action that they're, going to now shift and go back to the other side. So the timings are very important with that because traders will often, you know, in the third hour, the market's already moved 25 or 50 pips and they get an engulfment candle and they short it. Meanwhile, they're shorting into a trend now and they get stopped out and they can't figure out what, you know, why that didn't work because they sold at the high and it's an engulfment, but the trade was already underway from the equities hour. And, and now you're into the fourth hour maybe. So there's a very specific behavior once you get outside of that three-hour window. They've locked in the high or the low, and they're moving the market. And this is where you get into these the zombie hours, I call it. So they're moving the market. They may continue to trend as we head into the next session, or they may pull it back and now just meander back and forth and not have any real direction for the next few hours, which gets fra traders frustrated. They're trying to trade that in between, and that's where – Again, the market all of a sudden it's been moving, it's been going crazy. And you get in in this third or fourth hour, next thing you know, it's not going anywhere and you're sitting there. It, it just moved 50 pips in, in one hour and three hours later, you're still sitting about three pips off the price you got in. You can't figure out why. You can't go to break even. You can't get any profit out of the market. You're, you know, you don't know what to do. Hmm. And and meanwhile, they're just sitting there now waiting or moving it back and forth in a 25 pip box until the next session starts. And they're either going to stop you out or move it in the direction that you were trading in. So it's 50-50, which yeah. again, coming back to the question that you asked earlier about edge, my perception of working from the extremes is that is that as we get out to those extremes, my odds get better in terms of the probability that I may be in a, in a, my edge may be revealing itself better out at those extremes than it does on the inside of that high and low. Hmm. And the, the kind of, um, process that you go through with trading and the strategy, um, after putting so many hours into learning that, was there a point where you, where you thought, yes, I have this now, or was it a gradual process? <laughs> There's been several times where I thought I had it. <laughs> um, it's the aha moments were many. The mm -hmm. the realization that I could can do this consistently took time, because again, you you sit down, you you do some things wrong. You wake up the next day and you and you can't believe you did that. It's it's just you know, and you say today I'm just gonna do everything perfect. I'm just going to focus on the simple stuff. We always go back to simplicity and, and do everything right after we've had a bit of a meltdown. And so I try to approach that, the market that way every single day, just do everything right. Be patient. You know, uh, I've seen enough of the setups now that 
like even today, I just I, I was emailing with a trader and I was just looking at the pound Aussie and I was like, that's going going to go straight up 50 pips. It just kind of they jump out at you. Mm. And, you know, there's still always an element of of uncertainty that you say, well, this could still spike the low before it goes. And, you know, because it was in the last hour of Asia. But I think after a while, you see the same things over and over again. And then it's just a matter of walking yourself through the steps and talk. I, I talk to myself all the time. Just just do everything right. Do the right thing. You know, if you get stopped out, you can always recover something. Somebody told me years ago, you can always recover from, you know, a 15 or 20 pip stop as long as you haven't put too much size on that. That's just stick with your, you know, I have a spreadsheet. I just try to bump it up in increments after a series of trades. So I'll do 10 trades at a certain size. Uh, and then obviously there's certain trade setups that garner probably having a bit more size on them. And, and then there's days that you recognize sometimes in the middle of the week where you just know that those are the worst, like Wednesdays can be, uh, or yesterday was a good example actually on gold. So gold had a huge move on Monday, mass thousand pips. Tuesday, um, for my strategy on the, on, in that first couple hours was actually quite good, but throughout the day, that first few hours of, of Europe, London, it still was, it's, you know, they slow everything down. Um, and it's, it's big day, the day before moving everywhere. Then all of a sudden you're into this day and you're expecting another big day and it doesn't move anywhere. So I think it's, um, it's a, a matter of understanding that each day is unique. Um, keeping things simple. Don't big day Monday. Don't try to make, make Tuesday a big day. Just trade your system, you know, keep your size, keep your, your risk controlled. Risk is the hardest thing. Uh, I suppose for most people, they do everything right. They do everything right. And then they, then they do one thing wrong and they do it really big and, and it just blows out all the good work. You do 50 trades, perfectly flawlessly executed and one badly wrongly executed at size and it blows everything up. So mm. again, and learn, learn all these lessons the hard way. Yeah. And with the kind of discipline, I guess, and the patience with following that strategy for a long period of time, do you have any advice for someone who struggles with that? The best advice I can give somebody is to um, really know focus on one or two really simple, you know, trade setups. Uh, if you don't know what they are, go back, go through your charts and, and identify, you know, there's usually a couple of really big trending days every week. Um, focus on one or two simple setups, really focus on the risk side of things. If you do that right, uh, you can have a lot of losing trades and not, not get blown out, but you can still get better. And if you have a simple process that you can really get good at consistently executing and, and manage your risk and it has edge, you're going to go through a process where your results will be 50, 50, but you'll, your system probably has better, a better edge than that. But then you recognize you've got to work on just mastering the ability to be a high performer in terms of executing and becoming a very proficient trader. So that's, you know, we focus so much energy on that entry exit stuff and you could probably pick any model, any system you want and just know if you knew when to apply it at its best times, you could probably still make a ton of money, but we try to trade every single day, which is again, that the next phase is figuring out how to manage yourself. Um, so one piece of advice, uh, that's a tough one because I think there's, there's two master your edge and then master yourself. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, I also saw um, a video from you, I think three, four years ago, maybe, um, talking about health and nutrition for traders. How important is it that traders focus on these areas? Well, I think, uh, you know, coming again from an athletic background, um, I'm a firm believer that how you, how you move, how you eat, how you think affects everything. It spills over into your performance. Uh, trading is a performance activity. 
and I think that uh, for me, you know, my day starts early. I always work out in the morning. I have a swim. I work out at home. I'll ride or run usually later in the day. <clears throat> Excuse me, but nutrition, uh, you know, if you there's people who, and I know there's some great traders who, who are completely unhealthy. They smoke, they drink, uh, they eat junk food, and they could care less about exercise. And they're great traders. But I think uh, we're all human. And, you know, I think we all feel good when we move and exercise. I think it in increases your ability to think clearly, uh, be re relaxed and calm. I think if you're eating clean or eating, you know, healthy in terms of, you know, just no junk. Uh, I think that your body is cleaner. Uh, you're feeling better. You know, it all spills over in when the pieces are all together like that. I think that you uh, have clarity and I think that you are calmer. I think you can process information better. You're not uptight. You're not anxious. Uh, you know, whatever headaches, fatigue, stiffness, all those sort of things. Um, I think how we live each day can, can help enhance our performance in, in the arena. So, um, I think it's very important. I think it's, it's critical really, to be honest. Mm. And obviously trading can be quite stressful and quite tough on, um, your mental game. Do you have any tips for, um, how traders can have longevity mentally and physically trading? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I can only speak from my own experience. I think um, Paul Tudor Jones, there's a good interview with him somewhere. He said he almost blew out his account. He, uh, he got into a trade, and I can't remember what it was in, but he bought thinking that it was down low, and it was, it was, he bought the low, and it was going to reverse. And then he realized he was in a down move and a measured move and he needed to get out of the market right away. And he couldn't, it was limit down. They, they closed the market and the next day it was limit down. It was limit down like three days and he eventually got out, but he almost lost his entire trading account. And he said, and at that point he was obviously swinging big, big trades and just sort of getting in large and piling on making a ton of money, but then he almost blew up everything. And he said, um, why make trading uh, an, uh, such a stressful and unhappy experience? Why not make it a, an enjoyable one? And I, again, coming back to how I piece things together, and you know, I've done, I've done, I've done a lot of stupid things, trying to speed the process up. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I try to make sure that I do every day with my position sizing is everything is make it an enjoyable experience. So again trading at the size that you're comfortable with. And I think you need to, to build your size based on your results. So if you don't have results, you should be probably trading as small as possible and get the consistency, um, consistency and confidence and knowing that you are totally in control of the variables, your variables, so that your consistency is there. That, that gives you peace of mind. That gives you the confidence. And, and then that minimizes stress. Stress comes from uncertainty. And mm -hmm. whether that's uncertainty about your edge, uncertainty, be, uncertainty about how you're going to behave at the screen, um, you know, uncertain if you're going to do stupid things and blow your account out, that's what creates stress. So, again, coming back to... Uh, the two things that traders need to do, they need to master their edge so that you are like, you know, when they're, they're trying to shake you out of a winning trade, you have the, the full confidence to sit in there with your stop in place and let the market do what it's going to do. It's amazing how many times it will look like it's going to, you know, stop you out and it'll stop on a, on a dime and reverse and, and, all of a sudden start going in the other direction. Had you gotten out of that trade and, and it did that today on uh, pound Aussie, if you look on the shorter time frames, it, it stopped, went down three bars before it reversed on the one minute. And um, it definitely would have shook out some traders that were in early and then bang, it went up 75 pips. So I think uh, you need to have the confidence in your consistency, in your model. It's got to be simple so that, you know, there's not a lot of, again, uncertainty from, from you executing it. Nothing interfering with you 
executing that on a regular basis when that opportunity presents. And then knowing that you are in control of yourself, you know, in, in terms of your behavior, your emotions, you're not, you know, you get in a fight with your spouse or your <clears throat> friend, whatever, or you just got a big bill or you got stopped out on a trade. You're not going to react uh, and do things that are going to completely violate all the things that you didn't see in your back testing. <laughs> mm. So stress comes from not being in control of, of your behavior. It, it comes from not having certainty about your process, you know, all of those things. So if traders want to, you know, obviously there's always stress when you're trading your own capital. So, you know, even with that setting yourself up properly to be able to trade, um, not having to trade to make money every single day, but having money put aside so that you can cover your expenses, but also producing results and trading and increasing size as your results dictate and just, you know, baby stepping it. Baby steps in this game can work because it's a com you know, compounding effect. So patience is hard. We want it now. <laughs> yeah. So um and you've you've talked about quite a lot of uh, bigger traders in terms of like uh, people like traders that other traders know um, what's the worst piece of advice that you've been given uh, well I've had traders tell me they don't use stops um, I think I, I can understand their rationale with not having stops in the market uh, I think for the average person, I think for most people, that's a big mistake, uh, a huge mistake, because we all say we're going to get out at a certain point. And when it moves to that point, we say we're going to give it a bit more wiggle room. <laughs> and that wiggle room can tend to get bigger. And then uh, some traders, I know from my own experience, uh, you get to a point where that starts to balloon out and then you get into the the mentality where you don't care. You're just going to let it go until it comes back. And and that's where a lot of traders end up blowing their accounts out. I know a guy that lost $27 million. Um, really? I know another gentleman who, uh, we talked about this in the video today, he shorted the pound yen at the low of the year a couple of years ago just intraday trading and he refused to get out of the trade and he held on to it and it, and it ended up being the low of the year and it, it cost him somewhere wow. in the area of 90 or a hundred thousand dollars so wow. uh and again that <clears throat> the hardest thing i i spoke to a gentleman i uh, was on a webinar with him a few months ago peter anderson gentleman in sydney and he talked about being uh, in a trade back when 9-11 happened and uh, the margins and everything blew out because of the the uh, plane crashes and that forced him into a position to meet these margin calls and uh, that ended up shutting closing closing him down and, and it took him a few years he said to recover from that and not only financially but you know emotionally getting over that experience and that's what I think traders underestimate is the damage it does psychologically it's not even sometimes the loss itself is is big but it's more about the damage you do to yourself and and how many times maybe you've done that and how many times can you come back from that uh, but it's more about even knowing that you did the wrong thing and and that's evident that again you're not really trading you're just you're gambling and you know i've been guilty of that it's it's a hard thing not to do uh but when you use a stop, you know, again, coming back to the back testing, that's why I always laugh when people say, you know, you know, they got back testing results and all this. It, 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 there's so many things that traders will do when they're at the screen in a lifetime that, that you can compare six months of back testing with six months of live trading and they'd look nothing even similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, which again, you know, setting everything up it's got to be based on knowing that you're going to be doing things in live time and working from that as the end point so you yeah. stops <laughs> <laughs> um what was the best piece of advice that you've given them best piece of advice uh <clears throat> i've had a lot of really good mentors um 
I don't know, one, one specific piece of advice. Well, actually I could tell you Brent Penfold, he has a good saying. He's, he's always said, this is learn to be a good loser or le- learn to be the best loser. And, um, uh, you know, that again, being a slow learner, that took me a little while to really fully embrace. And, um, I think that is probably the best piece of advice. If you're a good loser and you have edge, you can become a great trader. Hmm. Um, my final question is what's some non-conventional advice that you would give to a new trader that wants to succeed? Do not read books, <laughs> buy courses, <laughs> um, everything that's out there in, in the retail industry is, is, is got it backwards. Uh, course, all those courses and everything else I think are, uh, for the most part, 90% of them are just regurgitated, uh, rubbish. Mm. Um, <clears throat> a non-conventional advice, uh, watch the clock, pay attention very specifically to the clock at certain times, right to the minute and how the market behaves. You'll be amazed at how, how important the timing is more than anything else. And that comes back to how uh, algorithms work. They work very specifically from highs and lows at certain times. Um, and that's pretty much it. Great. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say? And also, uh, where can people find you? I'd just like to say thank you for having me, Jacob. Uh, you know, I love I love trading. Um, my wife would attest to the fact that, you know, I've spent <laughs> – 20 years and, and my kids are, you know, young teenagers now. And, and I've spent a lot of hours. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm always at everything that with that they do, but still there's been a lot of hard work going into this. I don't think it has to be that hard. I, I did things the hard way. Um, I, I love, I love trading. I, I love the markets. I think it's an incredible opportunity. I think it is the hardest way to make easy money, uh, but it is a winnable game. It is a winnable game the big variable that people really need to work on is themselves. Uh, you, <clears throat> you're enticed into thinking that you need to, to do all these things or you trade, you need to trade all the time. And, and like, as we saw today, one trade today that's over in one hour, uh, those are the tr- sort of trades that you want to take. And even if you only took a couple of those a week, you, you'd, you'd be miles ahead. You, you could easily do, you know, triple digit returns on your account. But because we do all these other things, we trade, we trade more frequently. We take trades that are just, you know, piker trades that end up costing us money. They, you know, we do stupid things, you know, impulsive erratic things when we're in a losing trade, we'll average into it or we'll move our stops or we'll do whatever that just stuff that damages us. So Mm. if you can really focus on some simple things, and then step back and don't do anything that's going to do damage. And then just try to duplicate that and, and do less. You could probably do extremely well in trading. You know, you, you can do, as I'm sure you're aware, you can do damage at any point and regardless, which is why, you you know, I built in a, a lot of little steps even now, just making, you know, with your, how big you'll trade your account, taking stuff out, yeah. keeping it a certain size. Uh, but it's, I suppose um, gets a little bit easier. I always um, compare things to uh, I'm, I'm a person who drinks is only ever one drink away from opening up, I guess, a can of worms. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's like, you know, I have my rules, even with the timings, like today at five o'clock my time, I just get up and walk away and shut the charts off, which I never used to do. I leave them on all the time. Whereas now I shut them off uh, only because it's just like walking by, you know, even when you, you might just pop by to have a look and then something looks really good and you're outside of your window. Next thing you know, you're caught into something and you're sitting there six hours later and you're still trying to get out of it now yeah. and just stupid stuff. Uh, you know, I've done so many stupid things and, and again, I just kept peeling back the onion and seeing things that were happening 
not not completely understanding that and then you know again learning from people and putting pieces of the puzzle together uh, which even now like you know I've spent days just watching the one minute chart and the clock <laughs> <laughs> and just how many pips and when it moves and why it doesn't go to the high why it doesn't go to the low all these little things and then just learning and finding out why you know you know not knowing everything obviously but pulling the curtain back enough and then just seeing like, you know, one thing about gold right now, it's in the pound and very similar. Uh, all the pairs are very similar. They all do the same behaviors. Like I talk about it in this, this 12 candle window. Um, you know, the algo is kicking at a certain time and you can, you can, wa- you could cut everything out except for those 12 candles and still trade that. You could still trade that chart just knowing that you want to be selling high or buying low or buying a breakout pullback, you know, a continuation. Mm. So like in the old days when you were doing futures, there's always, you know, even with shares, there's gaps, right? There's gaps in the charts. Um, And the futures charts are really no different than if you just took the 12 candles, um, assuming they're using 15 minute charts and just looked at those by themselves. It's a new session. Uh, you might have the previous sessions, highs and lows, you know, just like market profile, the point of control and then, and then bang, there's another session that opens. So uh, everything in between in a lot of cases is, is designed to trap people or to extend the market out further before they reverse it in the next session. So, mm. but anyways, it's an, it's a living organism and it's uh, it's, you know, it's hunting us and I'm hunting it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, but I, you know, sorry, I was just going to say one thing I, you know, just with what I've sort of tweaked things down for myself is that, uh, you know, when I get a trade, I, you know, today, like I'm in, I'm out, I'm done. I don't want to, mm. I've given money back. I've not taken profits. I've held on, gotten stopped out of break even like the wor- the most frustrating thing, as I'm sure you are aware is you do the work, you get into a trade, you're in a good trade and you get spiked out or you get stopped out of break even. That's hard because you've, you've worked hard and then they get you. And mm-hmm. that's where I always cease to say like, you know, you, you got to take something off the table and, um, which is why, like I watched interesting on gold, they did the same thing. Um, but it was the very end of the, the hour so as it came to the end of that second hour, um, the, the gold was, had hit the high of the lower high that had formed in the first hour. So they were jamming volume down in that lower quarter. And as the hour ended, it was just kind of struggling. It had come down a few pips and then bang, the next hour just bang, spiked down. It didn't quite go to the low. It wouldn't have stopped out the guy who bought the low, but, um, might have shook them out, obviously, and then the next mm. candle pulled back, and then it went back up and hit the 50 pip original move from the low of the day. But a point I was going to make is that it was very specific to the beginning of the next hour. So they held that volume up there, they held it up there, but they didn't let them get out at the high, and then the next hour opened and spiked right down to the low. So, yeah. which is why I'm always watching the clock. I'm well, I'm so tuned to the fact that as you know, every 15 minute rotation. You know, you've got your one minute, but then there's five minute rotations within that. And then the 15 minute rotation and then the hourly rotation. And in that three hour window, uh, I'm watching it like a hawk because those algos are, somebody taught me something a few years ago. I, I, I saw something, I watched a video online and they were talking about, I already knew the timings were important, but I didn't configure that with the algos and the price and the time. And then like, and then I started measuring how many pips uh, every 15 minutes did they move it during certain times. And then other times how fat, like, you know, when they, when, when the market's volatile, it'll move uh, 50 pips in, in 15 minutes, you know, mm-hmm. and, and in slower times it'll move, um, you know, 25 pips in an hour. So it's just uh, little things. But every day I go back to the screen well aware that they can, uh, anything can happen. So 
as far as finding me, pretty much uh, my YouTube channel, or uh, I do have a, a blog. I, I don't update it a lot. Uh, mostly is on YouTube. I, I try to do two or three updates a week, just again, headspace and performance related tactics, just real specific about what's going on in the market. Just again, simplifying things. Um, it's, uh, it is very simple. It's just hard. It, we have a lot of reasons why we don't want to do it simple. So mm. we're convinced that, you know, all these things we read about and see and all that, it's, it's just you know, a lot of, it's just rubbish. So, but, uh, again, I'm grateful for, to be on here and, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, traders get some value out of that. And same thing on, on the videos, I try to give traders real time information that's going to help them when they're at the screen in live time to just step back and not get, you know, not get caught in uh, losing, losing money. Yeah. Thank you for coming on.